Lord, people of God, it's good to be with you and to open God's word once again together. Uh, I want to go back again to chapter 29. We'll just read the last part of chapter 29, uh, verses 38 through the end, uh, and remind ourselves of the importance of these continual reminders of the covenant realities that the old covenant people enjoyed, and think about how these things point forward to our Lord Jesus Christ. So Exodus 29, again, beginning our reading at verse 38. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs a year old, day by day, regularly. One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And with the first lamb, a tenth measure of fine flour mingled with a fourth of a hin of beaten oil and a fourth of a hin of wine for a drink offering. The other lamb you shall offer at twilight, and shall offer with it a grain offering and its drink offering, as in the morning, for a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. It shall be a regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak to you there. There I will meet with the people of Israel, and it shall be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Uh, Thus far the reading of God's word. May he bless it to us. So one of the things that we saw from these from these sacrifices, there were continual reminders of the covenant realities God's people enjoyed. And we talked about how one commentator called these covenant realities the kind of Emmanuel principle, that God is with us to speak to us, that God is with us to sanctify us, and that God is with us to dwell with us forever, to be our God and to be known by his people as their great and faithful redeemer. Uh, bringing to mind, once again, that great redemption that God worked in bringing them out of Egypt. But it's hard for us in the new, in a new covenant, New Testament perspective to hear that Emmanuel principle of God with us, speaking to us, sanctifying us, dwelling with us forever, and not to have our minds and hearts turned to our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the great Emmanuel. And so these, these realities that were before them every day, morning and evening, were also to remind them of their coming Redeemer, to point forward to Jesus Christ in a powerful way, to prepare God's people for him when he comes. Um, And of course, we should have our hearts and minds always turned to see the Lord Jesus Christ in the things that happen in the Old Covenant, in whom all the types and shadows of the Old Testament find their reality. Um, The first thing we are reminded of is that this was to be the practice in Israel, but we know that Israel often failed to draw near to God. Uh, There were times when they failed to give God the kind of worship he'd commanded in his word. Uh, There were times that they did do what he was telling them, but their hearts were not in it. Their hearts were far from him. Their lives were not sincerely dedicated to him. They were going through the motions. Uh, There were times in the history of God's people where he had to give them dire warnings, right? Warnings and calls to repentance um, because they had failed to draw near to God. And there was always that threat, you know, if you don't draw near to me, then you'll, you'll cease to hear my voice and you'll cease to be sanctified by my presence. Um, and you'll seek, you'll, I will cease to dwell with you for a time. Um, and that really is what, what happened in the exile. There's a sense in which God's glory departed from them and the temple and the altar were destroyed and no sacrifices could be offered and God's people were alienated from him in exile. Um, and it's a reminder to us that if we if it depended on us to draw near to God, we would never be able to do it. We would never be able to consecrate our whole lives and the fruit of our lives to God in a way that would be pleasing in his sight on our own. Um, we need help. We need the grace of God. That's one of the reasons these things had to be continually offered every day. Um, it was a constant reminder that God's people needed that dedication, needed that sacrifice to be offered. And that's really what Jesus came to do to fulfill that continual reminder, right? Because Jesus comes as the great high priest, the mediator between God and men, the true temple, the true Israel of God to make these pictures realities, right? So he comes to offer himself on the altar of the cross. Um, He offers himself. And what were they reminded of every day? There was this, there was a lamb that was put into the fire every single day. He And what did Jesus do when he came into the world? He was the Lamb of God. He offered his whole life to the Father, right? Like that Lamb that was offered, only he was the true Lamb of God 
who actually takes away the sins of the world. Uh, he offered his life and the fruit of his life to his father. right? Not just his life, but the fruit of that life, the perfect righteousness of his law-keeping life, the perfect atonement of his sacrificial death. Um, and it was a pleasing aroma in the sight of God, an acceptable sacrifice. Um, it was pointing them forward to Jesus who would fulfill what these offerings spoke of. And he offered it, it not that offering not just for himself, uh, but for his people. Um, all those who have true faith in Jesus Christ and look to, look to him alone have fellowship with God. Our lives are devoted to him because Christ has brought us near to God. Our lives and the fruit of our lives are wholly consecrated in Christ. Um, Jesus is the fulfillment of that daily sacrifice, the heart of Old Testament worship. Um, he wanted all of his people to make this connection, um, which is why he gave up his life on the cross when he did. Right? Jesus' life was not taken from him. He laid it down. Um, and when did Jesus lay his life down? Well, we know he laid his life down on Good Friday, um, but it's important, I think, for us to note that Jesus laid down his life on the cross at the time of the evening sacrifice, right? He died on the, at the hour of the evening sacrifice. So it's not just us trying to like stretch Jesus and try to find how Jesus applies in the Old Testament. No, he helps us to apply this because he gave up his life at the hour of the evening sacrifice, so think about that. Jesus is dying on the cross at the very time the priests are in the temple offering a lamb along with the bread and wine as they're burning the incense on the altar of incense before the veil of the temple. Jesus is dying on the cross. And in doing so, he finishes the Old Testament by bringing it to fulfillment. And it's entirely likely that the priests who were ministering at the altar of incense at that moment when Jesus died were standing inches away from the temple veil when it was torn from top to bottom. Uh, they were in there and there, there was that connection that Jesus was making. He is finishing that work by his death on the cross. Um, he's fulfilling what those sacrifices pointed to. A lot of people have pointed out that's probably why there were a number of priests who came to believe in Jesus. Right? Acts 6 verse 7 tells us, And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And a lot of people have thought probably one of the reasons why a lot of these priests came to be obedient to the faith was they were part of those probably who were in the temple ministering when the veil was torn. They had a front row seat to the fulfillment and could see that fulfillment vividly portrayed before them when the temple veil was torn from top to bottom. Um, and so they would have known that something supernatural had happened there, something out of the ordinary had happened, and that the way to the Holy of Holies had been opened, and it had been opened and they had not died. Right? They had seen the glories of the Lord, but they had not been consumed. And so... A lot of it's speculation. We don't know for sure, but a lot of people have said that's likely why a lot of these priests believed. Not only because they knew the Old Testament, but had served in the temple and saw the significance that the death of Jesus Christ had at that evening hour. Um, Jesus came to make those great covenant realities ours. Right? He is the voice of God speaking to His people. He's the Word incarnate. He meets and speaks to us in the Father's name. And that's why on the Lord's Day, we continue that pattern of morning and evening. Um, it's not required, it's not mandatory, but it's, it's, it's wise, right? To, that was the pattern to have that reminder be morning and evening. And we still try to do that every Lord's Day in a particular way, to, to morning and evening come and meet with God and hear him speak to us. We draw near to him and he draws near to us. Right through the preaching of his word and spirit. He meets and speaks with his people. That's why the sermon, the, the, when God is speaking to his people, is the most important central part of our worship service. Uh, the Lord's Supper holds that up. It's a support of that. It's a reminder of that. It's a reinforcement of that. But what's central in the worship is when God meets and speaks to us. Speaks to us in his word. Right? So the Lord's Supper comes along as a, as a visible word to support that preaching of the word. But you could not have the worship service without the sermon. 
You could not have a worship service where God does not speak because God came to speak to his people in the Lord Jesus Christ. He also came, comes to sanctify us with the glory of his presence. Um, that's why we are particularly reminded of that on the Lord's Day. But it's true every day that the Lord speaks to us in his word by his spirit and who's come to sanctify us with the glory of his presence. Remind, remember that Emmanuel principle, God with us to speak to us, which he does in his word, in a particular way through the word preach, but in his word as the Holy Spirit has delivered it to us, God still speaks to his people. He came to speak to us, he came to sanctify us with the glory of his presence. Right, Just as the people and the tent and the altar and the priesthood were not holy apart from his presence, so we are unholy people apart from the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what does he come to do? He indwells us by his spirit and sanctifies us by the glory of his presence with, it, with us by his spirit. We are being sanctified by the God who has made his tabernacle, his dwelling within us, who's conforming us more and more into the image of Christ until we leave this life perfectly holy, even as Jesus is holy. That's the work his spirit is doing among us. God speaks to us. He sanctifies us. And he's come to dwell in our midst forever by his spirit. Uh, that's why Jesus can say, I am with you always to the very e end of the age. Uh, he is with us to be God to us. Uh, to exert the power of his absolute authority for the good of his people and for his own glory. And his spirit dwells with us so that we would know that he is the Lord who redeemed us not from just from slavery in Egypt as God's people, but from spiritual death and the tyranny of the devil by his cross. The, the Exodus was the great Old Testament redemptive event. Um, and that's why when Jesus came into the world, he says, I have, I have a decease I must accomplish in Jerusalem. I have an exodus I must accomplish in Jerusalem. Uh, that was the great redemptive act that the Exodus pointed forward to when Jesus would deliver us from the iron furnace and the grip of the devil and free us from his tyranny by saving us from our sins. Uh, Christ is a redeemer, and he still speaks to us and says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. That's the great promise of our God, that he will be our God, and that we will know that he is the Lord, our redeemer, who has consecrated us and sanctified us completely, who will dwell with us forever. Um, to his praise and glory. Uh, may that be our hope. May these realities be confirmed to us. And may the Lord continue to help us as we look at the Old Testament to see how they speak. They spoke to God's people in ages past of the greatness of our God. Uh, but we've seen the full extent of the glory that's meant to be pictured there as these shadows and types have been fulfilled by our Lord Jesus Christ, who himself is the fulfillment of everything promised in the old covenant. Thanks be to God that we live on this side of the cross and have seen the glory of our Lord and his fulfillment of all these promises. Let's pray and give thanks to God. Father in heaven, how thankful we are for being able to make these connections and see how these Old Testament realities speak to us of the coming glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. How even your people in the Old Testament were taught about the coming presence of the Redeemer our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he has come. We thank you that he has done his redeeming work. We thank you that he still speaks to his people and still sanctifies us uh, and still dwells with us and will dwell with us forever. Uh, how grateful we are for his presence to, to, to know him and to be able to know him as our God, uh, to know the redemption that he has accomplished by his cross. Pray that everybody uh, paying attention to these videos and listening would know that hope of believing in Christ and having fellowship with you through your son. Um, we pray that your spirit would go forth in power that wherever the word is heard, that the Lord would speak to hearts and by the power of the spirit that they would be brought to newness of life and devoted service to our Savior. So thanks to you, Father, for all that you've done for us in Christ. Uh, forgive us for our sins and when we have failed to show you the devotion we ought to and help to renew us more and more by your spirit until we are like Jesus in glory. Hear us and help us in these things, we pray, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, people of God, it's been good to spend this time with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you until we meet again.